This lecture is going to cover an anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics review of the elbow. And so we'll get started by reviewing a few objectives that this lecture will cover. First, we're going to look at some of the different joints of the elbow, including the ligamentous, muscular, and neurologic tissues that contribute to the formation of those joints and also crossing those joints. We're going to look at some of the interesting variances that make the elbow joint unique, that being the carrying angle, as well as looking at a degree of valgus and varus and outlining potential clinical implications of each of those areas. We're going to discuss some of the myology, uh, areas relating to muscle length as well as moment arm and how that carries over into the production of elbow flexion. And then finally, we will help you to apply your knowledge of the elbow to interpret physical examination findings and then to differentiate between neuromusculoskeletal impairments. So let's go ahead and get started. If you'd like additional information that's covered in this lecture, you can look to several optional readings. Mike Raymond's text, pages 585 to 596, Orthopedic Clinical Examination offers a brief overview. If you'd like a, a deeper in-depth review, OATIS's text, uh, Unit 2 looks at the elbow and the forearm. Uh, you could also look at uh, Newman's uh, kinesiology text as well. So let's begin by appreciating some of the normal ranges of motion and movement that exists at the elbow. Now by definition the elbow is a hinge joint and so primarily we have flexion and extension. Extension being zero degrees fully in that extended position palm up. Flexion being as the arm, the forearm bends back towards the glenohumeral joint somewhere around approximately 150 to 160 degrees is clinically relevant. Additionally, if we expand our viewpoint from just the elbow and we look at the forearm as well, we can see a degree of supination and pronation, each contributing somewhere between 75 and 90 degrees in either direction. The joints of the elbow are made up of three different joints, and we'll look at each one of these in isolation. First, the humoral ulnar joint. This is what most of us would uh, more or less think of as the hinge joint of the elbow. It's a trochlear joint and a uniaxial hinge joint. The movements that exist here are primarily flexion and extension where the capsular pattern is that flexion is greater than extension. And when we look then at the open and closed pack position, the closed pack position would be extension with this degree of supination that exists in the forearm, whereas the open pack position would be approximately a mid-range position. And so if we consider 150 degrees to be clinically relevant, approximately mid-range would be appropriate, that being 70 to 75 degrees. Additionally, we can add in slight supination to also find the open pack position. The second joint that we encounter then is the humoral radial joint. This is a synovial condyloid joint, also uniaxial hinge joint with a capsular pattern that follows the humoral ulnar joint, that being flexion is greater than extension. The closed pack position here is elbow flexed to 90 degrees with the forearm supinated to approximately 5 degrees. And the open pack position would be full extension and full supination. Finally, our third joint is the proximal radial ulnar joint. This is a synovial trochoid joint. It's a uniaxial pivot joint, and this would be where the radial head encounters uh, the, the notch, if you will, on the ulna. The capsular pattern here is pronation and supination are both equal. Closed pack position would be 5 degrees of supination, whereas the open pack position would be mid-range supination of 35 degrees, as well as slight elbow flexion. Altogether, we consider these three joints to be a compound synovial joint. Now, if we visualize each one of these joints, the first joint that we encounter is the radiohumoral, or the humoral radial joint. This is the interaction of the head of the radius with the humerus. The second joint that we see is the proximal radial ulnar joint. Again, this is where the head of the radius interacts with the radial notch of the ulna and is held together via the annular ligament. Our third that we see here is again what most of us would consider to be the actual elbow joint, that being a hinge joint, and this is the ulnohumoral or the humoral ulnar joint. We can visualize both an anterior view as well as a posterior view. Anteriorly, it's important that you recognize both the lateral and medial epicondyle, uh, as well as the capitulum and the trochlea of the distal humerus. Posterior, you can see the olecranon fossa, which is the more concave structure that allows the olecranon uh, to move into that area as the elbow 
adopts an extended position. So let's start with a little bit more in-depth analysis of each one of these joints beginning with the humoral ulnar joint. It is a classic hinge joint that is held together via a capsule uh, specifically with two collateral ligaments, those being the MCL, medial collateral ligament, and then on the opposite side, the LCL or lateral collateral ligament. These are also referred to as the uh, bones that are, are serving as the more uh, proximal and distal attachments. And so on that more medial side is where we find our ulnar collateral ligament, otherwise known as the MCL. On the lateral side, LCL is where we find the radial collateral ligament. Now the MCL has two components to it. It has an anterior band as well as a posterior band. And then a third component that gets a little bit less pressed being the transverse band. We'll talk about each one of these, though it should be recognized that the transverse band helps to limit valgus stress on the elbow, uh, but the anterior band is, is a little bit more important. The capsular pattern we've already discussed. Additionally, we also want to identify the annular ligament of the radius that can be visualized in this image. Now, we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to the actual um, uh, radial ulnar joint, um, but it's a nice visual on Netter's slide here. Additionally, this is where we can find our biceps and triceps tendons. Um, those are visualized on this slide. And overall, when we think of all of these different structures that are kind of surrounding the elbow, it does provide uh, a very strong joint. Now, we brief previously talked about the capsular pattern, that being that a loss of flexion is greater than a loss of extension. Now, the question is, which loss has a greater functional consequence? And interestingly enough, functionally, if we were to lose a small amount of extension versus flexion, there's a much bigger consequence down the road. And the reason for this is we don't have a lot of extension already. When an individual uh, encounters inflammation or an injury about the elbow, uh, it's often a, a normal kind of clinical finding that a position of comfort is significant elbow flexion. The individual will adopt kind of a decreased willingness to move, will kind of uh, guard the position, and they end up in about 60 to 80 degrees of elbow flexion. Now, we think that the individual is doing this to minimize tension on the joint capsule and to alleviate any pain associated with a stretch of those capsular ligaments. However, what ends up happening is there is an adaptive shortening that begins to occur if that position is prolonged or maintained. And so what then can result is a flexion contracture. And so really the clinical bottom line here is anything that we do in and around the, the elbow really should be to minimize a loss of elbow extension and also to address any joint inflammation that may be contributing to this desire to adopt a, a more flexed position. Now additionally when we're looking at the elbow one of the other features that we should be able to visualize this is, is this idea of carrying angle. Now carrying angle exists between the capitulum and the trochlea as well as the proximal ulna and the radius. And it is the distal expansion then of the trochlea that really contributes to what we see as a more laterally deviated uh, form. Now, you can have an additional degree of valgus and varus that also exists in and around the elbow. And we'll talk about that when we get into the unit on the elbow as being an, an increase in valgus or uh, what we might call a gunstock deformity if, if an individual has a good degree of varus. Here you can see that carrying angle measured via a radiograph and it really serves to direct the ulna laterally during extension which interestingly enough increases the potential for elbow flexion motion. Right Now the midpoint distal humerus to the midpoint of the proximal ulna is really where we're going to make these measurements. The axis of movement then runs medially and inferiorly. Uh, we see the carrying angle most accentuated in full extension and it's typically thought that females tend to have a slightly bigger carrying angle than males by anywhere from 5 to 10 degrees though this can be fairly variable. Now if the carrying angle is found to be in excess of 15 degrees we refer to that that is cubitus valgus or an excessive valgus uh, angle through the, the cubital fossa. And then second would be cubitus varus, and that would be less than five degrees.
Now as we move on from our uh, proper hinge joint of the elbow, if you will, our ulnar humoral joint, next we encounter the radiohumoral joint. Now the radiohumoral joint uh, contributes a fair amount of stability, and this is where we find the LCL ligament, or the lateral collateral ligament. Uh, this also is referred to as the radiocollateral ligament, and it provides an accessory lateral collateral band and really uh, assists, if you will, in keeping that more lateral side of the elbow stable. Now we've already reviewed the movements in capsular pattern that exists here, um, but one of the things that we have to recognize and kind of the big clinical note here is if we don't have this, this uh, anatomical region or joint, if you will, um, this surface of the radial head articulating with the distal humerus, we really compromise our ability to bear weight. The radial head, because of its its broad kind of concave surface here, um, helps with the distribution over a broader surface area of any weight that's being borne through the elbow. Additionally, the radial head is also going to help to block this increase of valgus stress that's commonly seen about the elbow. And by doing so, it helps to offload some of the force that the MCL is having to um, deal with if you will, on the more medial aspect. And so because of this, there's a couple problems that can exist here. One, because of its, its ability to bear weight, we can see impaction fractures of the radial head, and we'll look at that further when we get into differential diagnosis of the elbow. Additionally, uh, because of its uh, capsular ligaments that hold it in place, it's also prone to dislocation. So let's look at those ligaments just a little bit further. Here we can visualize that radiocollateral ligament. Additionally, we can see just distal to that the annular ligament of the radius that we saw earlier as well. Finally, we look at the proximal radial ulnar joint. Now, the proximal radial ulnar joint's stability is contributed by the annular ligament that circumferentially uh, encapsulates the radial head and holds it securely within the radial notch of the ulna. The movements that are really contributed by this joint to the forearm are pronation and supination, with a capsular pattern being that pronation and supination are equally limited. With this view, we can visualize just a little bit better where that annular ligament is, as well as how it articulates with not only the joint capsule, but also the radiocollateral ligament there on the lateral aspect of the elbow. So let's look at these ligaments just a little bit more in depth. First, we'll look at the MCL, which arguably is one of the more important uh, ligamentous properties about the elbow specifically because it helps with resisting a valgus force from approximately 20 to 130 degrees of elbow flexion. It is taught in extension and we have these two cords, that being the anterior and the posterior cord. Many individuals believe that the anterior is the most important of the ligamentous complex as it serves to strengthen the elbow against valgus stress from approximately 0 to 60 degrees of flexion. After that, it serves as a secondary strength because then the posterior cord will take over from that point. It will be strengthened as we saw earlier by additional tendons in and around the elbow, that being specifically the brachialis and triceps. On the opposing side, more laterally, we find the LCL, lateral collateral ligament or the radial collateral ligament. Now there's more variance than what we see in the MCL. And here, instead of it becoming most taut in an extended position, it becomes most taut in full elbow flexion and really serves to resist a more varus force. Finally, we see the annular ligament, which again allows for this degree of pronation and supination. Now, it should be noted that it doesn't fully encapsulate the radial head because part of the radial head is captured by the radial notch of the ulna. Therefore, the annular ligament only encircles approximately 80% of the radial head. The last ligament that we want to review that serves to strengthen the stability, not so much of the elbow, but more of the forearm, is the interosseous ligament. And the interosseous ligament is going to bind the radius to the ulna, which therefore helps to distribute stresses between the two bones. Most of the tension that we find in the interosseous ligament will be uh, existent when the radius and the ulna are in a more neutral position. Now, there are some clinical implications that we would do well to consider, namely of the MCL. Uh, 
as demonstrated here in figure 11.23 from Oatis's text in unit 2, we can see an individual who's about to throw a ball. He's in the cocking phase and is now going to be ready to allow the ball to move in a more anterior direction as he goes in to release it. What ends up happening here though <clears throat> is that as they adopt this very large shoulder external rotation, there's a significant amount of valgus stress that is placed through the elbow. That repetitive stress can ultimately lead to microtraumatic injuries. And microtraumatic injuries are repetitious injuries that over time can lead to a bigger macro trauma or an injury of the MCL. If the MCL is torn, surgical intervention is often necessary, and this is where uh, many individuals have uh, had what's known as Tommy John surgery, which is named for the pitcher whose career was saved by it. And Tommy John surgery serves to reinforce and reconstruct the MCL by utilizing a graft tendon, typically from the palmaris longus or the plantaris. Now, the clinical application here is as PTs and rehab professionals, we have a role in reducing the incidence of not only MCL involvement, that being injury, but also the risk factors that lead to the injury by remaining in close communication and dialogue with athletes, parents, and coaches. Next, let's talk a little bit about the arthrology. Now, as we look at the joint, both anterior and posterior, you can notice a fair amount of articular cartilage that covers the ends of these structures. Now, because of the articular surfaces, um, one, the joint tends to be fairly stable and not a high incidence for osteoarthritis. Additionally, the orientation of those articular surfaces also help with regards to the percent or the degree of elbow flexion and extension, and you'll see that momentarily. Additionally here, you can visualize the fat pads and some of the synovial membrane that is uh, present both in the anterior and posterior portion of the joint. Now, as, as I was saying, the uh, degree of the articular surfaces or the angulation um, as it relates to the shaft of the ulna as well as the humerus does allow for some uh, uh, amount of flexion with soft tissue space between the ulna and the humerus. Now if that angle is less than 45 degrees it oftentimes can appear as if the individual has a de degree of hyperflexion. If that angulation which again is measured from the shaft of the ulna <clears throat> to the angle of the um, uh, more or less olecranon uh, fossa to the anterior portion of the ulna, uh, meaning it's greater than 45 degrees, now it will appear as if the individual is more in a hyperextended position. Uh, and the idea here is that they're displaced a little bit more posterior, and so this is oftentimes referred to as cubital recurvatum. Right. And figure 11.15 from Oedis's text gives a nice illustration. Uh, in the first image, image A, this would be a, a mutual anterior curve of the distal humerus and proximal ulna, allows for full flexion, but extension is somewhat limited. In image B, this would be a hypothetical increase in superior orientation of the trochlear notch. And so here we see an increase in extension, but a decrease in flexion. Therefore, they appear hyperextended. And then in image C, it's just reversed. Extension decreases, the flexion increases, and so they appear to have hyperflexion. Next, we want to look at the myology. Now, in these two images provided from netters, we can visualize not only the anterior aspects, but also the posterior aspects of the muscles of the forearm and proximal arm. Importantly, we can see not only our extensors and flexors, which have a significant role not only at the elbow in terms of pathology, but also in the functions of the forearm and wrist and hand. But we can also begin to visualize some of the dynamic restraints around the elbow. Structures like biceps brachii, the brachialis, and then distally the biceps brachii tendon. 
Additionally, we can see the uh, Pronair Terry's illustrated here. It's been cut and reflected back. Uh, we can also visualize other structures that contribute um, on the more posterior aspect. We can see the triceps brachii as well as the unconius, which is a secondary elbow extensor. Finally, we can also begin to visualize and appreciate some of the neurovascular structures that exist and cross the elbow. On the more posterior aspect, we can visualize our ulnar nerve as it passes through the cubital tunnel. On the more anterior aspect, we can visualize uh, our anterior ulnar recurrent artery. We can also visualize the median and ulnar nerve. The median nerve is going to continue anterior, whereas the ulnar nerve is going to uh, dive deeper and posterior through the cubital tunnel. And on the more radial side, we can visualize the radial nerve. A helpful graphic to remember how all these different structures exist is to take your hand of, of opposing side and place it over top of your elbow on the contralateral side. In this case, then you can use your thumb, index, middle, and fourth finger. And that can be a helpful way to remember that the pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis or FCR, palmaris longus, and then flexor carpi ulnaris, FCU, uh, moves from a more um, lateral to medial aspect at the elbow. Additionally, this helps to visualize uh, not only some of those neurologic structures that we were just discussing, but they're more uh, proximal orientation, that being our brachial plexus that then leads to those structures further down. Finally, we want to discuss a little bit of how the interaction of muscle length and moment arm interact as well before giving a comprehensive overview of the muscles about the elbow. So in this illustration, we can see a couple things. One, we can see the brachioradialis, the biceps brachii, the brachialis, and then finally the pronator teres. Now those are illustrated on the graphics to the right here. You'll notice on the vertical axis, we see muscle length and then moment arm. And on the more horizontal axis, we see elbow flexion angle. And so at the lower degrees of elbow flexion, the muscle length is fairly high. As we go with elbow flexion to a higher percentage, the muscle length decreases. So also with regards to our moment arm, we see a converse or, or um, a variance here that, that stands in opposition to muscle length, that being the moment arm is fairly short at the lower degrees of elbow flexion and begins to get very, very long as elbow flexion increases. So what does this mean? Well, it means that the ability to generate force has a sweet spot that correlates with our moment arm. And so as we begin to look at where is the position of greatest elbow flexion strength, we need to recognize that muscle length and moment arm interact together to create this sweet spot that exists somewhere around 70 to 90 degrees or mid range of the elbow. Therefore, if the elbow is in too much flexion or too much extension, we can say that there's a degree of insufficiency that exists here and it will impact then the ability of the elbow and, and the muscles that surround it to generate force. If we look at the comprehensive review of all of the muscles, uh, we can see first and foremost the triceps brachii uh, on the more uh, posterior aspects serving to extend the elbow. Um, the nerve and segmental levels here are C6, 7, and 8, with 7 and 8 being the primary ones and innervation supplied by the radial nerve. Additionally, we can see the enconius here. And then on the more anterior aspect, we see biceps brachii, both short and long head, as well as brachialis, with innervation being supplied by C5 and 6 of the musculocutaneous nerve. Finally, we'll look at the cubital fossa and the neural tissue that exists in and around this region. We visualized this on an earlier slide, though here we want to kind of zero in a little bit more on this triangular space on the anterior surface of the elbow.
So it is referred to as the cubital fossa, and it's the entryway point to the forearm or the antebrachium. And there's several contents here that are of great importance to function as well as um, potential differential diagnosis and pathology. So here we find the distal biceps brachii tendon. We also find the median and radial nerve, as well as our brachial artery, which is oftentimes where we will palpate the pulse. It can also be palpated just posterior and medial to the biceps more proximally. Additionally, we find our median cubital cutaneous vein in this region as well. Now those neural structures are fairly important and so one of the reasons why we want to be mindful of this is the median nerve passes between not only the humoral but also the ulnar heads of the pronator teres and in doing so it is an area of potential entrapment known as pronator teres syndrome that we'll discuss further in our differential diagnosis. Additionally we find the radial nerve that passes within the radial groove of the shaft of the humerus and exits medial to the brachioradialis. Now the radial nerve because of it passing proximally to the shaft is uh, at a potential risk should there be any pathology specifically traumatic pathology of the humerus that being a fracture. Finally, we find our ulnar nerve that passes through the posterior elbow. This is where we find the cubital tunnel, and an individual can again be prone to entrapment or irritation through this area. Ultimately, the nerve innervation to the elbow comes from roots C5 to C8 predominantly. We'll finish today's review with an overview of necessary elbow range of motion for normal ADL completion. Across the horizontal axis, you can see different activities of daily living, such as opening a door, utilizing a pitcher, uh, a chair, newspaper, uh, taking a drink from a glass, or even utilizing the telephone. And as you'll notice, uh, as you go across, the tasks uh, require a greater degree of range of motion. But hopefully you can appreciate that um, for most of these tasks, we need a fair amount of range of motion extending from approximately 30 degrees to about 130 degrees. And really, um, ideally from zero degrees up to about 140 degrees. So when working with an individual from a clinical standpoint and looking to return the individual not only to prior level of function, but hopefully an enhanced level of function, be mindful that range of motion is very, very important for their ability to independently complete and participate in these daily tasks. With that, we'll conclude our review of anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics of the elbow, looking at three unique joints. Have a look at the optional readings, and if there's any questions, feel free to reach out.